Pastor. Thank you for the blessing of our life together. Thank you for helping us to find a way just to keep putting one foot in front of the other in the midst of this crazy time. We ask your blessing upon our study. We pray, Lord, that you will use it to encourage us, to teach us, to train us, to inspire us, to nurture us, and to help us. I ask your blessing on these women and their families. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, one of our own is, uh, is unwell. So you all know Nancy Pikeman. She attends this regularly. She had a bad fall from a horse and was seriously injured, and she's in the hospital. So please keep Nancy in your prayers. Um, it's not the best time to have to be hospitalized, but by the grace of God, We've got phenomenal care, and she's receiving it. And some procedures that she's undergone have already gone well. And so we have high hopes that Nancy's going to fully recover from her fall, but it was a bad fall. So please keep Nancy in your prayers. Uh, we're making our way through the book of James. Today, um, if you'd like, we'll, we'll take a look at all of chapter 1 together. I think we should finish chapter 1 today so that next week we can take a deep dive into chapter 2. You remember really what it is that we're looking at. James should be read as what is most likely the first letter in the New Testament that had the widest viewership of any letter in the New Testament. So if you contrast it to the writings of Paul, which are much more influential in the church, and for good reason. But Paul writes a letter that goes to the church in Rome. The church in Rome receives the letter. They realize pretty quickly that this is God-breathed. They have friends, cousins, and others in other places that are in churches in other parts of the Roman world. They hand-copy additional copies of Romans and then send them off to other parts of the Roman world for their friends and cousins to read them in their respective churches. But that's how Romans gets out. That's not how, and that's how all those letters in the New Testament get out. Handwritten, sent person to person to person to Colossae, to Corinth, to Ephesus, all over. Not James. James, remember from the beginning, is a servant of God to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. The twelve tribes of the dispersion refers to the Jewish Christian diaspora out of Israel into the Roman world. This letter goes everywhere. So from the very beginning, this letter would have had multiple copies that were drafted and sent to the four of them. So the, the church in Jerusalem would have sent this letter to the churches in Philippi, in Colossae, in Ephesus, in Alexandria, in Babylon, in Antioch, in Rome, in Philippi, in Thessalonica, all over the places. So all the other places in the New Testament that get their own particular letter, think of that as probably the second letter they got, right? So when Paul writes 1 Corinthians to the church in Corinth, that's not the first time that they would have most likely receive a word from the church outside of their community. Most likely the first word they would have received would have been James. Because it's addressed, it's written by the leader of the church in Jerusalem and it goes to every Christian everywhere, right? The target audience is Christians that come from a Jewish background. But it's not the, the sole audience. Because it's not like he writes it and, it, and you know, they... they bring it into the church and fill in the blank town and they say, okay, all the Gentile Christians, you guys go over here. We've got something extra special just for the Jewish believers. No. This would have been for everybody. So the way for us to receive this letter, I think, is to remember the context of James. That this was, this would have been considered probably, broadly, the most important letter that was written in the first century. Outside the Gospels. It would have been received by the church that way. In many ways, the teaching of James is very bread and butter. That's why I wanted to look at it. In many ways, if you read the Sermon on the Mount from Jesus, whether you look at Luke's Gospels version or Matthew, or you take a look at Mark and then read James, it's going to sound real familiar. James, in many ways, operationalizes 
the teaching of Jesus into, okay, what now? I'm a believer. I profess faith in Christ. I'm baptized. What do I do? What does that mean? How do I live? James checks those boxes, answers those questions. So it's a great, rich, powerful, meaningful letter. It's also written to a church in a difficult time. I mean, he begins, remember verse 2, count it all joy, auto foy, brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. He's writing to a church that is under fire. He's writing to a church that is enduring trials. And the trials that they have are much more substantial than our own. I mean, they dealt with pandemics. Who knows what pandemic they would have been dealing with when this was written to them. And there was constantly, there was this challenge or that challenge. That was just true, right? I mean, for them, it was smallpox. It was cholera. It was plague, right? I mean, 400, 500 years after this letter, when plague hit Byzantium, Constantinople, a third of the population died. A third of the population died of plague. I mean, that's just... They dealt with epidemics and pandemics on a scale that we just can't fathom, right? And that was just, you just knew that you, you never knew when around the corner something was going to come in and it was going to decimate everybody for massive reasons. And that's without war, that's without dealing with persecution, which is the presenting issue that they're dealing with when they talk about trials of various kinds. So it is, I think, a helpful word for us to read, you know, because certainly for the first time in my lifetime, all of us are enduring a trial that we're all in together. We're all in this together. We, and I was born in the, in the mid-late 60s. And in my lifetime, you know, we certainly had our fair share of troubles and trials as a country. But there's a, there's a sense in which this is different because we're all facing through this trial together. And it's not just us, it's all over the world. So there is a sense of shared sacrifice, shared suffering, shared challenge, shared trial. And in many ways, that's what this letter is addressed to, a community that also is dealing with that. They're all facing trials. They're all enduring challenges. It's not this community's well, but this community is, is really having difficulties. So I think it's a great letter for us to read and walk through because I think it has a word for us. Sort of, okay, it's difficult. Okay, it's challenging. But we know and believe in Jesus. So... What do we do? How do we live? That's what James is all about. And I think it's really a great word for us to hear again today. So let's let's read through chapter 1 in its entirety and we'll finish it up today. Tina, why don't you get us started and then Ms. Bergfeld, why don't you pick it up and we'll just make our way around the side until we're all done. Do verses at a time. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers when you meet trials of various kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If anything lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Being a double minded man, unsteady in all his works. But let the brother of humble circumstances glory in his high position. And let the rich man glory in his humiliation. Because like flowering grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plain. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, Verse 12. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then the desire conceives and gives birth to sin, and when sin reaches full growth, it gives birth to death. 
Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Verse 18. Unbelievable. I mean, just what she faced and what she's endured and what she can do, it's 
What an athlete. Unbelievable. But you think about, I mean, there's, there's girls that I know in, at Christ Church who are teenagers that, that dance, that do ballet, right? And it's extraordinary. But it doesn't just happen. Right? It's not like they just go to Amazon, order some shoes, and next thing you know, they're doing the nutcracker. Right? It's an unbelievable hard work. Right? It's tremendous difficulty to be able to attain the skill and the conditioning to execute what looks to be effortless. Right? If you look at ballet on the stage, it looks Effortless, but what's behind the scenes is unbelievable effort and hard work. That's what he's talking about when he talks about the trials that lead to steadfastness, that leads to maturity. It's like the ballerina that can step on the stage in December and execute what? The sugar plum fairy dance. Right? That doesn't just happen. That happens because of what? Tremendous hard work. Unbelievable steadfastness through trial and difficulty. That's not temptation. You with me? It's a different thing. So he says, because he's dealing with a church that's under fire. And he's saying, friends, if you are tempted to be faithless, you're tempted to sin in the midst of this, don't blame God for that. God's not doing that. God doesn't want you to sin. God's not trying to lead you to sin. That's not God. That's on you. Right? So the, the work for you is to sort of say, no, verse 14. Each person is tempted when he or she is lured and enticed by what? His own desire. Sort of, it's, it's, it's just, there's, there's something in human nature that is always there that is vulnerable to making a bad choice. And that's just a fact. So the issue for us is we have to understand that, we have to acknowledge that. And we have to deliberately decide, I'm going to say no to those temptations and say yes to the Jesus way. And I'm going to do it again and again and again in all ways and shapes and sizes. He's going to talk about some specific ways in which we need to be faithful in the midst of temptation later on in this letter. But for now, this broad-based teaching, I think, is a helpful reminder of the difference between dealing with trials that can be fruitful and productive, like the sugar plum fairy dance, ultimately, and contrasting that to temptation that would lead to sin. And then verse 16, don't be deceived, autofoy, beloved brothers and sisters, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. It's such a curious verse. Because this expression about the Father of Lights is uncommon in the Scripture. It's not, this isn't a common expression, but it tells us that this is an expression that would have been used certainly in the first century. And I found this, I found a note that something I learned that I didn't know that was helpful. Um, there's a, a Bible scholar, Alfred Eldershine, who wrote a book, Sketches of Jewish Social Life in the Days of Christ. He wrote this book over 50 years ago. But in his research, he found this. He wrote, the, the Jews in the first century celebrated daily this before repeating their Shema. So remember, the Shema is the essential prayer of the Jewish people. You know, hero Israel, the Lord, the Lord your God, the Lord your God is one. But... In the first century, before they would say the Shema, they would say other things. And he wrote this. The following are the benedictions before the Shema in their original form. Blessed be thou, O Lord, King of the world, who formest the light and createst the darkness, who makest peace and createst everything, who in mercy gives light to the earth and to those who dwell upon it. And in thy goodness, day by day and every day, renews the works of creation. Blessed be the Lord our God for the glory of his handiwork and for the light-giving lights which he has made for his praise. Selah. Blessed be the Lord our God who has formed all the lights. So, so I, just, I didn't know that. But what that means is that when James, who is writing especially to a Jewish Christian constituency, refers to God as the Father of Lights, 
He's speaking a language that they already know. Because this reference to God as the Father of lights is something that's rooted in first century Jewish teaching. Every single day, when they would recite the Shema, they would hear this prelude to the Shema that would refer to what acts of God? God as the light giver. God is the God that created the light, that turns on the lights, that keeps the lights on. And it serves really two purposes, right? Number one, it's a reminder that the source of life is the light. Because the essential light that we have on the earth is the what? The sun. What does the sun do? It makes possible what? Life. Life. What does the sun do? It enables plants to have growth, to produce fruit, to allow us to exist, right? So we, the first reference when you think about God as the God of lights is sort of getting back to the main thing, which is the source of life. The second thing is sort of the metaphor behind that is what? What else comes with the light? What happens right after we turn off the lights? Dark. We're in the dark. So there's also this metaphoric sense of what does it mean that God turns the lights on? It also, He turns on your mind. It turns on knowledge. It turns on wisdom and understanding. So it's both ends. It's both God as the Father of lights as a reference to God as the essential source of life itself. But also God as the Father of Lights is this inference to God as, as making it possible for us to learn, to grow, to see, to exist, to enjoy, and all the rest. So it's, just, it's a beautiful phrase, actually, that is uncommon in the New Testament. But for the first century Jewish reader, this would have resonated because they would have had this language of God as the Father of Lights every day when they would say the traditional Jewish morning prayers. So, something I learned, I'm going to share that with you all. Fascinating. So, let's take a look at this next part. First, verses 19 forward. Verses 19 through 21, I, I've described this as words to live by. Because this is where he started to get really now into the nitty gritty of, okay, what do you do? How do you live as a faithful woman of God? Know this, beloved Adolfoy. Adolfoy, again, is brothers and sisters. Let every person be quick to hear. Slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of anthropon, human being, does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, <coughs> which is able to save your souls. So he sort of gets into some real bread and butter here. Remember, he's writing to real people. He's a pastor, he's a Christian leader who's writing to human beings just like us, followers of Jesus, who lived from Ephesus to Rome to, you know, Colossae to, you know, Syria in the first century. Three quick initial pieces of counsel. One, be quick to hear. Be quick to hear, quick to listen. So, it's a reminder for us, I, I thought about this, for the church in the first century, the scriptures that they have, is exclusively the Old Testament. When they're receiving this letter from James, what they have is they have the Old Testament and they have the oral tradition of the Gospels. Right? They don't have New Testament texts when they receive James. Remember, this is the first letter. They don't have New Testament texts. So they don't have a Gospel of John in their home church that they read when they gather for worship. They don't have that. It doesn't exist yet. John hasn't written it yet. Right? So when he says, be quick to hear, it's a reminder that how do people receive the gospel when in this era? They receive the gospel from what? From a speaker. It's oral tradition. They're not reading it. They're hearing it. And they're hearing it from a human being who's in the room who's saying, let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you the story of Jesus. Let me tell you what he says. Let me tell you what he taught. Let me tell you what it means. So for the people that are receiving the gospel in the first century, and certainly in the first half of the first century, which is when this letter was written, they're receiving the gospel orally. That's how they're doing it. So the first piece of counsel for them is, be quick to hear is broadly true, but it's especially true for the Christian in this coming. He didn't say, you know, be careful to read. 
which might be what you'd say to us, right? Because we're going to grow in our knowledge of the gospel more often than that by reading it. But for them, there's nothing to read yet. Right? So they have to be quick to hear. And I, I put this, you know this quote, it says that an ancient you know, Greek philosopher, Zeno, said, we have two ears and one mouth, therefore we should listen twice as much as we speak. <laughs> See, I thought that came from my nana. <laughs> Because she used to say that all the time. Little bit I know that she picked that up from Zeno. <laughs> and then sort of the second piece follows. Be quick to hear and then what? Slow to speak. Same wisdom. Right? Same wisdom. Sort of the, the, long, the more you talk, the less you can listen. Be quick to hear, be slow to speak, and be curiously slow to anger. The first two we get. The third, be slow to anger, speaks to the condition of the church that's receiving this letter. So remember, James is a pastor. So why would he tell this community to be slow to anger? Because they are. Because they're dealing with anger. Right? I mean, think about the counsel you give to your, your kids or your grandkids. The counsel that you give them is in relation to what they're dealing with. You're not going to sort of randomly sort of give them some counsel about, you know, advanced physics if that's not an, an interest to them, right? You're going to speak a word that's appropriate to them. And so this tells us something about what the church in the first century, this is the church, this is the church throughout the Roman Empire. James is going to everybody. Remember the diaspora church, this is everybody. What they're dealing with. They're dealing with anger issues. Why would they be dealing with anger issues? What do we get from the first, the, the second and third verses of the first chapter? They're dealing with what? They're dealing with trials. They're dealing with difficulties. What, what, what's something that can come when we are just sort of dealing with adversity? Anger. I mean, have, have you noticed anybody you know that, that has a shorter fuse now than they used to because of just constant stress? I, I, I certainly have it, but maybe you have it, right? I mean, so what you know? What can come when people are dealing with stress, with trials, with challenges? All the time. Unrelenting, right? We can get a shorter fuse. We can be quicker to what? Snap. Quicker to snap. You know, my children are funny. Over the last few months, my children have, have begun an interesting practice. They'll go into the kitchen uh, before their mama gets home from work and they'll they'll clean up the dishes. And they'll put them away. They'll do all that and and I think they do that for two reasons. I think they do that, number one, because they're, they're wonderful kids and they love their mom and their daddy. I think number two, they're prudent. And they probably appropriately recognize that if they do some little things that show good faith efforts to be helpful around the house, then if a parent comes home after a difficult, stressful day, that parent is less likely to what? <laughs> right? right? What is that? It's human nature. Amen? So, just, it's a great, I think, again, yeah, this is why I want to do James, but this is a great word for all of us, I think. Right? It's written to a church that's dealing with trials. Be quick to hear, be slow to speak, and be slow to anger. You know, anger, it's funny, I've heard so many justifications, and, you know, sometimes I'm tempted to make them for anger as righteous indignation. Right? But from my own experience, the frequency with which anger in me is appropriate righteous indignation is pretty minimal. Most of the time if I get angry, it's not accurate for me to describe it as righteous indignation, but just as a sin. It's just wrong. It's just me not at my best. Right? And that's what the scripture teaches. Pretty uniformly, and I, put, I cited some places, Ephesians 4, Colossians 3, Titus 1, 
and then Old School, Old Testament, Proverbs 29, and there's a lot of places in Proverbs that speak to anger. But this is a memorable one. A fool gives vent to his anger, but a wise person keeps himself under control. Just words to live by, right? And what did Jesus say? Matthew 5. Lest we just think this is Solomon and his kind of pie-in-the-sky teaching in Proverbs. Jesus says, I tell you that anyone who is angry with his adolfoi, which means brother or sister, will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. So should we take seriously, sort of, dealing with anger issues? Yeah, we should. So again, this is where James is really parroting the traditional teaching of Judaism. It's certainly the teaching of Jesus, you know? Be quick to hear, be slow to speak, and slow to anger. Verse 20, for the anger of anthropon, anthropon means human being, typically translated man because it reads a lot better, right? For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God, right? That God's what, remember what righteousness is. Righteousness is right behavior. And it flows from right belief, right? The word righteousness and the word justice in the New Testament are synonymous terms. It's a Greek word, dikaiosene. It means both things. It means righteousness and justice. So what does he say? He says that the righteousness of God, which is true righteousness, right? Essential righteousness, the highest righteousness, the highest form of justice. Get that word in our culture a lot right now, right? True justice, true righteousness doesn't come out of anger. Doesn't anger doesn't produce that, right? Anger produces even if it's even if anger comes in response to something that's unrighteous. Often, if anger is where it's coming from, there's a lot of collateral damage, isn't there? Right. So, uh, I mean, fill in the blank in a community in America, an African American gets shot and killed wrongly. Right? By law enforcement officers. If the response is anger, and that response leads to looting and destroying businesses that communities have built for generations, especially in minority communities, and other peace officers having bricks thrown at them, do you see how anger doesn't produce the righteousness of God? That there has to be a better way? To sort of get to where we want to go as a people than just giving vent to anger and burning everything down and blowing everything up. I mean, it's sort of copy-paste any scenario. I mean, that's just low-hanging fruit because we're dealing with this moment, right? But it's just the trial. What he's, what he's saying is if anger is, where, is the source of action, it doesn't produce the righteousness of God. Even if it's rooted in righteous indignation, if you let anger be the ruler, bad things are going to happen. You're going to say things that are ugly. You're going to do things that you're going to regret. Right? Therefore, what? put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness or humility the implanted word that is able to save your souls. He's saying what? Take a break. Take a breath. Stop talking, listen, receive the gospel, and let the peace of Christ flow over your heart. And then what? Great things are going to happen. Your soul will be saved. You will do some good. And you'll get through this time of trial. You know? Just a great, again, it's just practical wisdom. How do you live? How do you live in the moment? How do you live through this? How do you live through anything? And then verse 22, be doers of the word. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. This is a, an essential memory verse, really, for me, ladies. Right? Be doers of the word, not just hearers, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like the anthropon, the human being, the woman or the man. He's like the person who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, and he looks at himself, and then he goes away and forgets what he was like. Right? It just means what? If, if all you're doing is listening, and you're not responding to what you're learning, then you're just, you're never growing. 
you're, it's never really sinking in. There's never really growth and development. It's like, you know, raising kids now. My kids aren't real big fans of testing. <laughs> like testing. Surprise. But I am. I am. Because testing, testing reveals what? I mean, better than most things. Did they learn? If all they have to do is just listen to lectures and do labs, but they never have a test, how can you know? And if they know there's not going to be a test, if they know there's not going to be an evaluation that's going to reveal whether they learned it or not, is there less motivation to actually really dial in and learn? Of course there is. Because there's always something else to do. And there's always something else we might want to do. So testing can be fruitful. So what is he saying? He's saying, don't just be a hearer. Don't just sort of listen and listen and listen and think, I got this. Be a doer of the word. And this is consistent with you know, what's all over the scripture. Romans 2, it is not the hearers of the law that are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. The word justified means saved, right? Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but what? The person who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 7, everyone then who hears these words of mine and what? Does them will be like the wise person that built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat, but that house didn't fall because it had been founded on the rock. And, and the converse of that is really comes is like James 1.22. Everyone who hears the words of mine and does not do them will be like what? The foolish person who built their house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell. And great was the fall. Sort of and, and one of the reasons why you know I think James is so helpful is that. Since the Reformation, I, you know, we it's like throwing out the baby with the bathwater. The, the and I'm you know I'm an evangelical Christian. I'm, I'm a Protestant, you know? but you know part of the challenge for you know the Protestant tradition is we were so dialed into opposing Roman Catholicism and Roman Catholic teaching that we, we our our sole focus for the longest time came to be what is the teaching, what is the doctrine. What is the belief? And then we would reduce Christian belief or Christian faith to words and ideas, right? I mean, these are, do you believe these things are true? Or, or do you believe these doctrines? And sort of say that's the means test to faithful Christianity. Do you hold these beliefs? What does Jesus say? What does Paul say? What does James say? The beliefs are what? They're, they're important. But the beliefs aren't going to save you, right? Are they? What does he say? Are the beliefs going to save you? It is not the hearers of the law that are righteous before God, but the doers of the law that will be saved. That yet yeah, you believe those things are true, great, that's important. But then you have to what? Act on it. You act on the belief. That's the means test of being a Christian. The means test to a Christian isn't that you can say the words of the creed. The means test of the Christian is that you believe them to be true and then you live like they are. Right? That's what he's saying. That's what I love about James. It's like, let's just talk turkey. You know? I mean, because he's, he's writing to a church that's dealing with real life in a difficult time. They're dealing with real trials. And it's like, guys, it's not going to be easy, but you can do this. Get after it. That's what he's telling them. So he says, be doers of the word, not hearers, and only deceiving yourselves, because that's the danger, verse 22. Right? The danger is that you're going to kid yourself in thinking, I'm fine with God because of your beliefs. And he's saying, no, don't, don't deceive yourself. Your beliefs don't make you fine with God. How you live out those beliefs faithfully, that's the means test. The righteous woman is the one who what? Follows the Lord. What does Jesus say? Think about the 101. I mean, what does it mean to be a disciple? Jesus says, if you would be my disciple, deny yourself, take up the cross and follow me. So are all those things things that you just think? Do I think about denying myself? 
Do I have ideas about self-denial? Do I have, you know, doctrine about following Jesus? All those are about what? Being a doer of the word. All of them. Right? Deny yourself, what? Do. Take up the cross? Do. Follow Christ? Do. I mean, James isn't giving us a new teaching. He's sort of, he's operationalizing and expanding and making concrete sort of what is the call of Christian life. And that's, and that's why I love it. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a person that looks at their natural face in the mirror, but they look at themselves and then they go away and forget what they were like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, she or he will be blessed in her doing. Ah. So he says, keep looking. Do look. Read, study, learn, right? But then the next step is what? You look at it, and then you persevere. You persevere. Persevere in what? In your doing. Persevere in your doing. Keep going. Keep following, right? As a disciple, keep following Jesus. Persevering, being not a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. She will be blessed in her doing. Verse 20, if anybody thinks that she's religious and doesn't bridle her tongue, but deceives his heart, that person's religion is what? What does your translation say? Verse 26? Yeah, kind of again. James is pretty, pretty severe, isn't he? I mean, he's only he's sort of like saying, look, let's not waste time. Let's cut to the chase. You know, he's he's not he's not selling. He's not a he's not a politician. He's not trying to make friends and influence people. He's just telling the truth. What is the truth? If you think that you're religious but you're running your mouth saying ugly things, then what? You're kidding yourself. You're kidding yourself. If you think you're mature, if you think you're a strong believer, but you're gossipy and you're angry and you're mean-spirited and you're saying ugly words all the time, you need to take a long look in the mirror and realize, kid, you got a long way to go. I mean, that's a great word for me. You know, I think it's a great word for any of us. Because the tongue is so... It can be such a tool for harm, can it? Can it? Think of it now. I, I unplugged from Facebook in March. I don't even. I don't remember my password anymore. I don't know what it is. I mean, I literally, I, I, I turned, I turned off my apps. I unplugged from it, and I just turned it off. Because there was just so much that was ugly that was out there. When this whole thing started, and there was conspiracy theories, and people were getting angry, and I just remember thinking, and these are people that I love. And I thought, I, just, I don't even want to see it. Because I just don't have the energy to try to respond to all this. And it's just exhausting. So I just, I unplugged from it because of this. Because I know myself. And I know there would be a temptation for me of, of going, oh, really? <laughs> what is that? That is my tongue through my fingers. <laughs> right? That is sort of, that is speaking through what? Through text. It's in print. It's out there for everybody else. It's the same thing. And so the word here isn't to say simply stop talking, but what is the word that he uses about how to deal with Keeping your tongue from doing harm. What is the word that he uses? Bridle. Now, I know at least one person in the room who knows something about the use of a bridle. <laughs> Ms. Tina, tell us, what is a bridle for? What is the purpose of a bridle? Control the horse. Right. <laughs> it's a means of control. To ensure what, it doesn't keep the horse from moving or acting. It controls the direction of the horse, right? And sort of the principle is, your tongue also needs to be bridled. That you need to make sure that it doesn't get out of hand, that it doesn't do more harm than good. Because the tongue can be extraordinary. What did he just say? Be what? What are the word? Be hearers of the word. How do you hear the word? In the first century especially, when you don't have a New Testament, how do you hear the gospel? 
Somebody's saying it. So he's not saying stop talking. He's saying that the tongue needs to be bridled because it can do great good. It can be a source of unbelievable blessing, but it can also what? It can do harm. It can cause injury. If you think you're religious and you don't bridle your tongue, but you deceive your heart, then your religion is worthless. I, you just have, you have so much work to do. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this. Here's an ABC. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. This issue about special regard to orphans and widows, this again comes from the scriptures. So I put a number of places in your notes. Broadly, God reveals a particular concern for people that Jesus refers to in the New Testament as the least of these. So the scripture is clear, cover to cover, that God has special concern for the most vulnerable and the weak ones. Right? And you get that from, and I've cited places from Exodus forward. It's all over the scripture. And it's all over the New Testament. But among this group of the least of these, there are some people in the Old Testament that have particular, um, a particularly special place in God's heart. And for whom God calls the church to have a particular regard as well. And those folk are especially orphans and widows. And also in the Old Testament, what are called resident aliens, which we would call people that are, that are people that aren't from here. People that are traveling, people that are visiting, whether they're there permanently or they're there temporarily. Why? Because they're so vulnerable, right? They're coming on on horseback. They don't make a reservation through Expedia. They're either sleeping outside, dealing with weather, or somebody's going to help them, right? But before then, you have orphans and widows. Why orphans and widows? Why are orphans and widows categories of folk for whom God says, I especially care about them, and you need to also. Why then? Because they are dependent on their husbands or fathers. Yeah, that's right. And if their husbands are deceased, they don't have social security disability. They don't have, they don't have pension benefits. So they could starve. Right? So there's no, there's no social safety net that's provided by the state. They're dependent, you're totally dependent 100% on your family. So if you're a widow in the first century, and your husband is deceased and your kids aren't there, right? then how are you going to live? I mean, it's, it's, it's a real present challenge. And so what the Old Testament instructs is he instructs the people of God to say, Y'all need to take care of them. You need to make sure that those women in the community that are especially vulnerable are taken care of. Because, because without you, they're in if, they're, if their husbands aren't there to take care of them, and their sons aren't there to provide for them, then you need to step up and take care of it. Because the Romans aren't going to do it. It's your responsibility. And in the New Testament, it's the same teaching. And it's widows, and it's also orphans. Same idea. Right? Who's going to take care of a child that doesn't have parents? Is the state going to do it? In the first century, the answer was no. The state's not going to do it. The state didn't have orphanages. They didn't develop state-run orphanages in the first century. The community had to make a commitment saying, we got, we're going to do this. And who did that? The, the, the synagogue and then the church. So the tradition today of you know Catholic social services, right? This tradition of, you know, the Catholic Church, I think, has the strongest tradition of, of providing for adoption services and all the rest. That is consistent with 3,000 years of history of the people of God. That's what we've done. Absent the state, without the state being involved, of the, the faithful people saying, we got this. That's, that's what this is about. And so he says, at the end of the day, if you're just talking about being faithful, but in real time you're not doing what God has required of you, then you're getting yourself. 
And so you know, the, the categories can change because for us, we wouldn't think of widows as the most vulnerable now, would we? I mean, they can be, right? But the world that we live in today is extremely different than the world of the first century. That we do have a safety net in our, in our nation state, right? That we have provision, we have economic situation that is different. So when you think of who is the most vulnerable broadly in America, it's not necessarily widows. It can be, but there's other folk that are not widows at all that are super vulnerable, right? So that's why I think the word from Jesus about the least of these is a great way for us to have that in our mind, is that the least of these absolutely can be the widow, absolutely can be the orphan, but it can be other kind of folk. And what he says is what? Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to do what God's asked you to do, to do what you're supposed to do as the faithful. In this case, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and part B, to do what? To faithfully follow Jesus. To be faithful. And to be faithful operationally, not just theoretically, means what? To keep yourself unstained by the world. Remember, who's he writing to? The church of the what? The diaspora. This is a community of Jewish people and believers that now live where? All over the Roman world. They don't live in Jerusalem. They don't live in a place where there's the temple. They don't live in a place in which what is normative culturally is to be a follower of the Lord. That's not where they live. Instead, they live in Roman cities all over the world. They live in Rome, they live in Philippi, they live in Ephesus, they live in Colossae, they live in Thessalonica, they live in Alexandria. They live all over the Mediterranean rim. And in those places, what is normative is paganism. Is pagan values, is power, is corruption, and is egregious sin in all sorts of ways. Right? So when he says what? Do these two things. Do what the law demands you to do, which is to take care of the weak ones, and also do what the law demands, which is what? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, which means what? That you say no to those temptations to sin and to follow and to capitulate to the standards of the community. In this case, a community that is egregiously sinful. So that's really what he's saying. It's just sort of a great sort of, how do, you, how do we do this? You know, he's saying, how do we get through this time of trial, friends, in the first century? And he says, here's what you do. You do these things. You bridle the tongue. You're, you're slow to speak. You're slow to anger. You do what the law demands, you take care of the weak ones, and you resist the temptation to follow the sins of the world. You do those things and you what? You will have a religion that is not worthless, but instead what? Is righteous, is strong, is useful, and will help get you through. So it's a great sort of bread and butter, how do we do this, how can we do this? And it, I, I, what I love also about James chapter 1 is to remind that, you know, we can do this. Is there a word of hopelessness in James 1? No. It's like saying, you know, it's not easy, and it's real, but you can do this, and here's what you need to do to faithfully follow Jesus in the midst of a difficult time, which I think is a great word for us. So questions or comments about the first chapter? The Lord be with you. Father, thank, you thank you for the day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for these women. Thank you for the life you've called us to. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to be salt and light in the world. We pray that you would help us to, to turn our anger over to you. We pray that you would help us to be slow to speak, to be slow to anger, to listen, and that the words that we say and the things that we do and write would be edifying and would bear witness to you and our love for you and our commitment. We thank you, Lord, for helping to get us through this time of trial. I pray that you pour out your blessing upon these women and their families and all those whom they love. We pray for our friend Nancy, that you'd bring her total healing. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. God bless you.